Hey Harbour City, it's Amy here. As you can see, I'm wearing my best pajamas to watch church with you this morning. Cannot promise that I won't be able to shake this habit when we go back. But yeah, this morning I just kind of hope for a supreme sense of joy and a reminder that God has not forgotten us in these crazy times, but that He loves us and works all things to His good. If you are anything like me, you are missing communal worship and prayer. So I really hope that today during worship, during our sermon that you're just feeling the love of God and feeling the love of the community that is around us. So from the depths of my heart, have a wonderful Sunday and hope to see you soon. Hey Harbour City, um, I'm Kate, this is my husband Kyle. If you don't know us, we're the cool kids who always hang out at the back at church. Um, yeah, we're just sending you a quick hello from us. Over to you Kyle. Yeah, we just went solo, um, we down the south coast, able to get away just for one or two days, which is nice. Um, you know, I just break the monotony of the, the good old lockdown. Um, really hoping all of you guys are doing well. Um, and yeah, we just, we can't wait to um, be able to meet again and just be able to see new faces, old faces, and you know, just say hello again, person. Yeah. Um, we've been enjoying the coffee down this side. Not quite as good as Harbour City's coffee, but it'll have to do. Shout out to Nick Mitavia for his awesome coffee skills. <laughs> Anyways, guys, we miss you. Looking forward to when we can all meet again. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Morning, Harbour City family. For those that don't know me, my name is Angie. I'm just checking in to say hello and to say I'm really missing our community time on a Sunday the delicious cappuccinos that are a hit with everybody. Can't believe that it's been five months since we've got together. For me, the five months have been a time of reflection, prayer, a roller coaster of emotions. Um, but I think it's been a good time. Um, really can't wait for us all to get together again as a community. Wishing everybody love. Bye. Hello Harbour City family, my name is Lee. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say hello to all of you virtually and tell you all how much I miss and love you all so dearly and how life is just not the same without the Sunday coffee and gathering to worship together. Um, I miss that terribly. I also miss the opportunity that I would have had to go to our first, my first church camp at Harbour City and um, I look forward to the day when we can resume everything that was normal for us. Um, if you're needing any encouragement, this is really why I'm making this video. Um, I have experienced loss um, over the last couple of months. A lot of my family members have passed away and it's been a hard time. But one thing that has remained constant in this ever-changing world is that God's word remains true and God himself remains true. And that has been a source of strength and courage for me. So if you're like me and have experienced challenging moments during this time, I hope that you know that the one thing that we can hold on to is God. And um, he holds the whole world and that is our courage. Um, and yeah, I miss all of you so much and I can't wait for us to um, resume, you know, whatever the new normal looks like. And I can't wait to see all of you again. Take care, so much love and I can't wait to be chaotic and loud. Um, yeah, I miss you guys so much. Good morning, everybody. Why won't you grab a coffee outside and come on in into the venue? And <laughs> oh man, yeah, we really miss those days, but we want to welcome you into our home. We're going to do some worship this morning, and we actually hope and pray that you can make your personal space, whether it's in your, in your kitchen or your lounge, your living room, your bedroom, or in your car maybe, or even on the street on your way to somewhere with your earphones in. We hope you can make that your personal space of worship this morning. And actually, why won't you stand up with us and join us in prayer and just consecrate your space and your time this morning to worship our Father. <laughs> oh Lord, we thank you for this new day that you've given us and that we can lift up our voices and raise our hearts to you, my King, and glorify your name this beautiful morning. Father, may you hear our praises and our worship, and may you actually change our hearts and our thinking in terms of just having thanksgiving towards you this morning while we do that, Lord. Open our hearts for the sermon this morning as well, and we pray that you can change our ways, Father, and, and, and revitalize us and refresh us and renew our thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Cool. Let's do it. From 
the highest throne to the earth below you lay down your life for the likes of us great is the love of the savior from a wounded heart to a life made whole every human heart will declare as one Great is the love of the Savior, Lord of endless light. Let your glory shine forever. All the earth, all the earth will sing your praise. From the mountain heights to the valleys low all created things given life to show Jesus we live for your glory from the rising sun to the still of night every waking moment for your delight Jesus we live for your glory Lord of let your glory shine forever all the earth all the earth will sing your praise hope of every heart let your name be lifted higher all their hearts all our hearts will sing your praise God be exalted, God be exalted in everything. We live for your glory, live for your glory. God be exalted, God be exalted in everything. We live for your glory, live for your glory. God be exalted, God be exalted in everything. We live for your glory, live for your glory. Lord of endless light, let your glory shine forever. All the earth, all the earth will sing your praise. God be exalted in everything. We live for your glory, live for your glory. Oh, God be exalted, God be exalted in everything. We live for your glory, live for your glory. light let your glory shine forever all the earth all the earth will sing your praise hope of every heart let your name be lifted higher all our hearts all our hearts will sing your praise
worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name the sun comes up it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. like never before oh my soul i'll worship your holy name i'll worship your holy name lord i'll worship your holy name every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one that could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me And holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. There is no one 
like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Good morning everyone, it's Grant here. If we haven't met before, I just wanna say it's great to have you joining us today. And I hope you are having a really good start to your Sunday. Uh, we are jumping into a new teaching series today called Abide. And you're gonna hear that word a lot over the next couple of weeks as we go through the series and just see what a beautiful word it is and just the significance of it for our lives and our walk with Jesus. Now, I think this series is for everyone. Uh, and I wanna say if you are exploring Christianity today, if you are checking out Jesus and his teachings and what Christian spirituality is all about, I think the series is for you. Uh, and I think if you've been walking for Jesus for a long time and wanna grow in your faith and wanna know God more and want change in your life, the series is for you. And I think for all of us, honestly, in the midst of what we're going through at the moment, if you are feeling tired or weary or down, if you are asking questions about what is going on and where is God and maybe why are my prayers not being answered, I think this series will be helpful for you too. So I'm looking forward to this and I trust that you'll be encouraged. We're going to be in John 15 verse 1 to 11 for the next three weeks or so. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, you can. And we're going to be talking a lot about vineyards, vines, branches, grapes, and fruit, and really the relevance of this to our lives. And I'm really excited. I think this is so, so significant for us. But maybe if you are turning there in your Bibles, while you turn there, I don't know how many wine fans we've got watching this today. I do know maybe saying the word wine is like a bit of a curse word at the moment because during lockdown, we can't have any, we can't drink any wine. Maybe that'll be lifted in the next week or so. But Shell and I have really enjoyed the times we've gotten to do wine tasting in Stellenbosch and Franschuk particularly. Franschuk is a really, really beautiful town. And actually on our honeymoon, we got to do this for the first time. We really, really enjoyed ourselves just over a couple of days doing wine tasting, maybe once or twice a day. Like you quite quickly become a bit of an armchair wine snob. You know, you go from knowing nothing on day one to being like this pro, just condescendingly looking down at some of these great wines because you've tried so many different varieties. But there is something so good about going to a wine farm and just the beauty of a vineyard. The beauty of just the surroundings and the landscape, just the beauty of walking through the vines. I think at the last vineyard I was at, I was able to pick grapes off and just taste how the different Shiraz or Cab Sav or whatever grapes tasted and to see the difference. But there is just such a beauty to it. I think what, one of the things I've loved so much about being on a wine farm is speaking to the person doing the tasting or people who work there and just hearing the romance and love that is behind the wines that are made. You know, you'll hear from um, the person serving you about the tour and just the climate and the topography and just the uniqueness of that plot of land that they are on and how those grapes uniquely grow up. You know, whether they're thin or thick skinned grapes, the processes that the farmers are involved in to just raise those grapes up and then what 
what the winemaker does to transform that grape into the beautiful wine you taste. You know, whether it's the time it spends in the barrel or what the barrel is made of, or if there are chips put in the, the wine, or, or what flavors are coming out of the grape and why, and how they have grown that. You just see the intentionality and care and process that is at work in a vineyard. And I say all of that to say that a vineyard is a very intentional place with great care taken of each vine and branch to produce the fruit that the winemaker is after. And in John 15, we see all of these elements that go into our own spiritual lives. John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine, Jesus says, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, in Durban, in an urban setting like this, we don't really have those agrarian uh, landscapes or ideas like just in front of us all of the time. You know, we're, we're used to the grittiness of the city. We're not used to the beauty of the landscapes of vineyards and vines and branches and grapes and all of that. If you do want to see this kind of thing, there are a couple of vineyards in the Midlands. You could take a drive out sometime and check that out. But this is not our everyday life. But for Jesus' hearers, the people listening to him tell the story, they knew exactly what he was talking about. Maybe as they walked out of their front day door in the mornings, they would see a vineyard, or maybe it was just around them. But, but this was familiar. This was everyday stuff. And I say that because Jesus was a master teacher who took the everyday, ordinary, um, simple things around people to explain deep and profound spiritual truths in a way that they could understand. And really, John 15 is a very simple message. You know, what we see here, four elements. Jesus is the vine. God the Father is the vine dresser or gardener or viticulturalist. His disciples, most of us watching this today, we are the branches. And our goal as disciples is to bear fruit, the grapes or the wine that we've been talking about this morning. So this passage is very straightforward. But as always in the scriptures, the, the Bible is such a rich multi-layered, multi-textured book of truth. And as we read this, there are so many things that we can miss if we just glance over this teaching. Now, I'm just going to pick up one of those today as we get into it, and it's in the first five words. In uh, verse 1 of John 15, Jesus says the last of his I am sayings. Now, if you've never heard of those before, it's actually a pretty famous thing. We could do a great seven-part series on this. But throughout the book of John, we see these I am sayings of Jesus. John 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John 8 and 9, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John 10, Jesus says both that he is the gate and that he is the good shepherd. In John 11, he is the resurrection and the life. In John 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And where we are today in John 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine and, this is the first one with a bit of an addition, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Now Jesus' I am statements might not strike us that much. We might go, oh, interesting, good to know more about Jesus. But to the first century Jewish audience that Jesus was speaking to, he was dropping bombs when he said any of these seven things. And that's because instantly an alarm would have gone off. People would have been triggered as Jesus said these and would have thought back to God meeting with Moses in Exodus 3 and what God had to say to him. Let's look at it together. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? Pretty good question to ask. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. 
I am has sent me to you. When God says to Moses, and Moses then repeats that his name is I am to the people around, this was a pivotal moment in redemptive history, or even in the history of the world, as God was taking the Israelite people out of captivity and slavery in Egypt, and taking them into a new life, into his promises and plans as his people. So as Moses comes to God and speaks to him, and God reveals something about who he is, and what he does, and what he's like in this name, I am we get this picture of the glory of God being revealed to Moses. You know, the eternal, unchanging, self-existent God, the infinite and glorious God who is perfect in every way. He is revealing himself in that moment as God. And this would have been a key pivotal moment in the stories that were told by the Israelite people to one another. So when Jesus says this, or when we read, I am the bread of life, we go, That's interesting. Jesus is comparing himself to something that can satisfy us. So we get what he's trying to say. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the one that can satisfy our most existential, deep, physical, emotional, spiritual needs. The the things that are so core to who we are, Jesus can meet us in that place and satisfy us. Now, the first century Jewish hearers would have understood that too. They knew bread. They knew what Jesus meant by this. But even more loudly than Jesus saying that he can satisfy our need for salvation and life is the fact that Jesus was saying, I can do that because I am God. I am who I am. And in John 15, we cannot get around the fact that Jesus is calling himself God when he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener or vine dresser. And that means that we have a decision that we need to make as we read Jesus' words here. We need to decide what we're going to do with the fact that Jesus calls himself God, because he does. So are we going to accept that, the the fact that Jesus is God this morning? Or do we think when we read that, well, that Jesus is lying? That Jesus knew he wasn't God, but he said it anyway to deceive people for some reason. Because then that would make him an evil person and not someone we should follow. Or if Jesus is saying that he is God, and maybe he does believe it, but it's not true, then that makes him kind of deranged. He's crazy. He's out of his mind in saying these things. Those are really the only three options we've got when we come to moments like this. So I want to start today's message by asking you, who do you say that Jesus is? And do you believe that he is who he said he is? Do you believe that Jesus is God, the great I am? Now let's go a little bit past those first five words. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck for a long time there. I don't know if you notice the word abide popping up again and again and again, as I read earlier, but the word abide pops up 10 times in those 11 verses. Five times, Jesus is saying, abide in me. Once he says, abide in the vine, which is also him. So it's really six times he's saying, abide in me. Three times he says, abide in my love or abide in God's love. And once he speaks about God's word abiding or living or dwelling in us. So that's why we've chosen this name for the series. And that's why today I want to talk specifically about abiding in Jesus as a foundation for this whole passage. And in John 15 verse 4, Jesus says very simply, Abide in me and I in you. Abide in me and I in you. Seven words, one simple invitation this morning to come and abide in Jesus. Now that word abide is what pops up in a lot of translations. Some translations choose to use the word remain or dwell or even reside to explain what Jesus is talking about here. So in John 15, Jesus is using this illustration of the vine and the branches and the vineyard and the gardener to explain what he means by abiding in him. But maybe we can use another illustration. I think for many of us, we've moved house, some of you, many, many times. And you know when you make that decision to move, that there's a lot of work that goes into it. You've got to pack up your house, put things into boxes, fill suitcases, take things off of walls, neatly pack things with paper around them and tape it. It's a whole deal. And then not only do we have to move out of that house, but we have to move into a new one. And really, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's inviting us to move into him, to come in and make ourselves at home, to take our clothes and hang them up on the hangers, to put our pictures up on the walls, to make ourselves at home, to get comfortable, to take off our shoes, to put up our feet, and to enjoy our new home, to be in Jesus, because he is where we live now. That's what's going on in John chapter 15. 
And this passage is all about intimacy with God, knowing God, relationship with God. And what we see here is that before Jesus talks about us doing anything or bearing fruit, which is the language of this passage, Jesus starts speaking about us abiding and living and dwelling and remaining and residing and setting up home inside of him. And really we get this picture that we see again and again throughout the scriptures that what we do as Christians flows out of who we are in Christ. But I think what often happens is even those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a long time, we don't abide and dwell in him. What we are more likely to do is to come to Jesus for, our be- for his benefits and then just carry on with normal life. So maybe you hear a sermon and it's like Jesus offers forgiveness and we go, I could use some forgiveness. I've sinned. I've messed up. I know I'm not perfect. Forgive me, Jesus. We receive forgiveness and we carry on with our lives. Or maybe there's a message about the fact that Jesus' blood can wash us clean and we think, I actually feel a bit dirty this morning. You know, I've sinned. I've I've messed up. Stuff has been done to me. I've done stuff. I, I feel a bit of shame and guilt in my life. I could do with being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And we get cleansed. We're washed clean. We feel different and we carry on with our lives. Well, there's something about miracles and the power of God to help us in that time of need. Even when things feel impossible and we go, I could use a miracle. I could use some answered prayer. Jesus, would you help me? And then we move on and we carry on with our lives. But that's not what is being talked about here. You know, when we do that kind of thing, we don't actually want Jesus. We're not actually packing up our old life and moving in to Jesus and living and dwelling and abiding in him. No, we're just using Jesus for the things that we want and that we need from him. So often what we do is we come to Jesus and we get what we want and we move on. And we can see that relationship with him is pretty transactional. Jesus gives me what I need and I live the life that I want to live. But that's not what's going on in John 15. In John 15, we set up home in him. We don't come and go. I think probably for a lot of us, we've used Jesus more as a petrol station. You know, when we find our own spiritual or emotional or existential tank, pretty much on the empty, we're on the red. We pull into Jesus, you know, we come to church or life group or we spend some time alone reading or praying and we say, Jesus, fill her up. I need something in my tank so that I can keep going. And we pull in, our tank gets filled up, maybe we clean the windscreen, fill up with water and oil, and then we carry on until the tank is empty again. Or maybe another way of looking at it is the shower. You know, the shower is in your house, but you don't live in your shower. You go in the shower in the morning or the evening or I don't know, whatever your situation, hopefully most days. And we shower to be clean, you know. If you're feeling dirty, if you've been on a hike, you've been playing sport, you've been in the mud, like you want to get that off of you. If you're sweaty, and I mean, Durban is sweat city, like during summer particularly when it is so humid, we just want to get that off of us and cool down. I think when Shell and I didn't have aircon or fans in our flat back in the day, you know, like we would just be in the shower once or twice a day just with cold water just to cool down and be refreshed. But Jesus isn't like a shower, just cleansing us of our sin or refreshing us when we're tired. No, we're called to dwell in him, not just come and go when we have needs. And in John 15, we see that Jesus isn't just something that we use when we have a need. He is our life. Jesus is our life. We don't come and go out of our relationship with him. We set up home and we dwell and abide inside of him. See, that's the picture in John 15. The the vine is connected to the branches. It's a permanent attachment. And those branches are drawing on the life from the vine to survive. They're dependent on the vine for everything. The vine is their home. The vine is where they live. The vine is their address. It's where they get their mail sent. They don't come and go as they please. And Jesus is saying to us today, come to me and abide in me. In Matthew 11 verse 28, he says, come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a wide open door invitation to everyone. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I'm lowly and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Speaking to a number of you recently and just other people I've come into contact with uh, around Durban. It just seems like a lot of people are pretty tired at the moment. Pretty weary, worn down or, or up and down, emotionally up and down. You know, people are dealing with different challenges from health things to sickness to losing loved ones to issues at work to salaries being cut to Zoom fatigue and Corona fatigue and wanting change or normality or just an idea of when things are going to be the way they used to be. or What is the new normal? 
just so that we can kind of carry on with life. We're uncertain about the future and really we don't know what to expect. And if that's you today, for, for whatever reason, if you're feeling weary, tired and burdened, Jesus' answer to us isn't come to me and I'll show you what to do. And I just go, thank God that Jesus isn't going to tell me the things I need to do to find rest. The other thing is he doesn't say, come to me for a quick top up, kind of like the petrol station or the shower method. Come to me, I'll refresh you and you can carry on. No, his answer is come to me and I will give you rest, but it's found in me. You need to stay with me. I am the answer. Abide in me and you will find rest for your souls. You see, branches don't survive on their own in the wild. They've got to be connected to the vine. And that vine goes deep into the ground and its roots spread out. And it draws on the nutrients and life of the ground. And it pulls them up into the branches. And the branches feed off and live and produce fruit from the life that is inside of the vine. We depend on the vine. We depend on Jesus for our life, for our power, for our strength, for our renewing and our refreshing. Everything we need comes from him. Some of you will probably know this popular fridge magnet kind of Christian bookstore bookmark scripture in Isaiah 40 that says, Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And in Isaiah, we're hearing similar words to Matthew 11 and John 15. It's come to me. Wait on me. Hope in me, trust in me, and you will renew your strength. In John 15, we abide and draw on the life of the vine. In Isaiah 40, we wait on God. We wrap our lives around God and we draw sustenance from God to be able to carry on doing what he's called us to do. And there's this amazing hopeful truth in those verses. You see, Jesus' illustration of the branch and the vines says a very different message to what we often hear out there and what we often hear from religion. You know, religion says do, whereas Jesus says abide. Religion says try harder, whereas Jesus has said to us on the cross, it is finished. I think maybe my favorite translation of Matthew 11 comes from Eugene Peterson's message translation that says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. If this morning as I'm speaking, you are looking for hope or life or rest or salvation from something, Jesus says, come to me. Come and find it in him. You know, come to him and abide in him and you'll find what you need for your soul. But the second thing that this verse tells us is also mind-blowing. John 15 verse 4, Abide in me, we've talked about that enough, and I in you. And this is kind of a, a mind-bending truth that Jesus is also saying here. Is yes, we've got to pack up house and move and abide and live and dwell in him. But he does the same thing and Jesus comes and moves in with us. And again, as I've said, you know, this is not kind of the petrol station situation where you come and go as you please. Jesus doesn't come and go from your life. He sets up home and he stays. You know, Jesus doesn't see your heart as a kind of convenient to lock up and go place to stay. He, he just kind of goes on the weekends. He's very flexible. No, he remains with you. And I want you to see this here. Jesus is with you always. He's with you when you abide and when you don't abide. He's with you when you kind of pick the come and go life, not just the abide life. He remains with you. Even when you sin, when you mess up, when you fail, when you make a mistake, or even when he feels distant to you, he is with you. I really do feel that for some people today, that you are feeling like God is distant to you, and you think that's because of something you've done. John 15 verse 4 shows us that even, even when we don't feel him, he abides with us, he is in us, he will never leave you nor forsake you. And not only that, not only does Jesus abide and he will remain with you, but verse 9 says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This verse is a window or a peephole into the relationship of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in this perfect eternal relationship between God, the Trinity. 
Now, this passage in John 15 is found in a wider passage from John 13, really to John 17. But this is the last night of Jesus' life. This is the last supper dialogues as Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he spends a lot of time talking about the Holy Spirit in those verses. We've already seen in verse 1, he talks about the Father, you know, the vine dresser or gardener. And he speaks a lot about himself as the vine, the, the one that we abide in. But we see this picture of the Trinity here in these verses. And we see in verse 9 that the love that the Father has for Jesus, his Son, is the same love that Jesus has for you and I. I think that's a hard thing for some of us to believe. Now, I want you to just stop and think for a second. How much do you believe that God the Father loves Jesus the Son? You know, how much do you think he loves him? How do you think he feels about him? Because obviously God is the perfect Father and Jesus is the perfect Son in every way. So their love for one another is perfect. You know, it's, it's infinite, it's unconditional, it's pure and spotless. It's the kind of love we most desire. And the Father has that kind of love for the Son completely. I, it, it kind of blows my mind to think about it because I'm a new dad. My daughter's nearly six months old and I'm in love with her. Now, when I saw her being born, I thought to myself, this is probably the moment of greatest awe and wonder of my life. Cannot believe this is my girl. I'm a father. She's my daughter. And there was instant love for her. Everyone had told me that would happen, but I couldn't believe it. And even when she's naughty or whines or poops on herself or, or just we have a difficult day, She is such a delight to me. But I know that even though I feel like my love for my daughter is great, that God's love for me and God's love for his son, Jesus, is far greater. It's more pure and beautiful and infinite and untouched and spotless in the love that I desire more than anything else. And what we read here is that Jesus loves you, which I think a lot of us can kind of go, yeah, I know that, Grant. I've heard that before. Jesus loves me. I get it. But more than that, Jesus doesn't love you just with some low-grade, imperfect, cheap, bargain, generic kind of love. Like, oh, I love you. You know, we can say that so flippantly. But what we read here is that the greatest love in the universe, the love that the Father has for the Son, is the same love with which God loves you. Now, don't disqualify yourself for a second. I'm pretty sure some of you are doing that going, maybe you, Grant, maybe some of the people in Harbor City, but not me. I don't deserve that. I'm not worthy. I haven't earned that kind of love. And that's the best part of this. You know, Jesus doesn't say that you're loved because of anything you've done. You've done. You're loved in that way because of who God is and what he's like. Now, I've been married for almost or over eight years now, and I love my wife incredibly. But if she all of a sudden didn't believe I loved her, for for whatever reason, if she doubted my love or questioned it, she became anxious about how I felt towards her. And if she didn't remain in my love, didn't feel it or experience my love, that wouldn't change how much I love her. And I want to say to you today, if you are not remaining or abiding in the love of God, if you don't believe it's true, if you're disqualifying yourself from it or rejecting it, that doesn't change the fact that God loves you as strongly and as passionately and as purely as he loves his son. But why would you not want to enjoy that and step into it and experience that love? If that love is yours, even if you don't feel it, let's begin to live in that love and live from that love, to abide in it to make our home in it, and to be changed by it. You see, what you see here is that you and I are invited in John 15 to participate in this perfect love and intimacy and unity that we see between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, in the early church, probably around the 4th century, uh, a word was coined to describe their relationship. It was the word perichoresis. Now, that probably sounds a lot like choreography to you because they've got the same root. And choreography has really got to do with dancing. So they used to describe the Trinity as the divine dance. That from eternity past into eternity future, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in loving, intimate, perfect relationship, were engaged in this divine dance of intimacy and closeness and love. And what we see in John 15 is it's like Jesus is inviting us into the bubble of the Godhead. He's saying, you can come and join us in our love and relationship. I am in you and you are in me. You are a part of this perichoresis journey now. We're welcomed into the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's a very intimate place to be. As I said, I've been married for over eight years. The 26th of May uh, 2012 was our wedding day. Uh, I'm glad I got that right. 
But uh, on that day, Shell and I had our first dance, as so many couples do. And I'm sure for those of you who've been married before, you remember that moment. You've been at weddings where you've watched people do that first dance, uh, either between the father and a daughter or between a husband and a wife. And there is just such intimacy and love in either of those dances. I think for Shell and I in that moment, uh, for some reason, our song got messed up and some random song came on and it took a few minutes for them to find the right song. So we literally stood there on the dance floor with 120 people around us watching us and just kind of held each other and just laughed and chatted and whispered in each other's ears and kissed one another. And when the right music came on, we just continued. You know, we, we were besotted with each other. We were just kind of in our little love bubble and I don't remember much of that day, but I just remember being with her. And really, that's what Jesus is speaking about here. He is welcoming us into the dance of Father, Son, and Spirit, into the loving, intimate closeness that comes from being part of that relationship. As he says in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As he says in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Harbor City, the picture here is if you are a Christian today, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us and we're getting closer and closer with God. Now, for you and I, knowing that we are in Christ is foundational for our identity because there's so many things that we can find our identity in. I mean, I am a man, I'm a son, I'm a friend, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm now a father, I'm a pastor. I still like to think of myself as a skateboarder, even though the last time I was on a skateboard just feels like it's getting further and further away. Uh, before lockdown, I was a boxer. And during lockdown, I've been doing a lot of reading. So I'm a solid reader at the moment. But those things don't define me. At the heart of who I am is the truth that I am in Christ. And there's a lot of aspects to that. You know, In Christ, I'm a son of the King. I've been adopted into God's family. And I've been chosen by God to be part of His family. Which means I'm valuable in God's eyes. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. I've been washed clean of my sins and my past, and I've been set free from the power of the things that used to enslave me and hold me. I'm made new. The Bible calls me a saint, a holy one of God. And as we've seen in verse 9, I am loved by God as much as he loves his son. That's how loved I am. That's how loved you are in Jesus. Are you in Christ today? And are you living in that identity? Are you believing that this is true? Are you abiding in the love of God and abiding in these truths? Practically, one of the things I've done during lockdown to grow in abiding in Christ is that I've set a couple of reminders on my calendar each day. This is a practice the church has been doing for just centuries called the daily office or the daily work, just finding ourselves in God's presence in prayer. Now, I don't always spend a lot of time in those slots, but I think what I've always done is I've woken up early in the morning most days, and I've spent time in the Bible and prayer, just enjoying God, being filled with Him as I go into the day. But I've wanted to add these slots throughout the day, normally at lunchtime and at the end of the day before I go to bed, just to remind me, even if it's for a minute or two, just to pause, to close my eyes, just to get a bit of solitude, just to be with God, to, to abide in the vine, to draw on His life to be reminded of who I am, to be reminded of how much he loves me, to experience that love and then to carry on. You know, you know, I want this to become more and more of a habit of my life, practicing the presence of God as I wash dishes, as I shower, as I bath our child, as I cook dinner, as I work, as I sit at the lap, my computer and work, as I drive around, whatever it is, I want to be in the presence of God, abiding in him, drawing on the life of the spirit and experiencing the fullness of what is going on in John 15. That's what this is all about. I don't want to pray more out of guilt. I want to pray more because I want more of God. I'm not doing this just to earn brownie points with God. I'm doing this because I want to experience more of Christ and become more and more like Him. And Harbor City, I want to invite you into abiding in the vine. For some of you today, I think you need to be joined to the vine or grafted into the vine. You maybe didn't know Jesus before this morning, but today is the day of salvation for you. Today is the day to become a branch in the vine of Christ and join in in the vineyard of this church. And that would mean that today you need to respond to Jesus and his invitation to come to him. It means that this morning you need to acknowledge that Jesus is God and that he died on the cross for your sins and mine. It means that today that you would find your home in him, that you'd pack up your old life and move into him and abide in him. 
that you would stop abiding in other things and abide in the vine and find rest for your souls. And for those of us who've maybe been walking with Jesus for some time now, maybe we haven't been abiding as much as we've been coming and going with Jesus. And we want to make a change. We want to start to abide in him. We want to draw in the fullness of the life that is in Jesus and know him more and more. Now, you might not like the way I do it. You might not be a big calendar person or want to set reminders. But would you find a way in your own life during this week to grow in abiding in this. I, I think we are so easily busy and distracted, struggle to find margin to do this, but we need to fight to be those branches drawing on the life of the vine, not just coming and going, but living in him and experiencing our identity in Christ and drawing on the fact that God loves you and I just as much as he loves Christ. Let me pray for us as we close today. Jesus, I pray for those who need to be grafted into the vine, that today you would save them, you would forgive them of sins and wash those who need to be clean of their pasts, that you would adopt them into your family as your children and they would experience your love and they would find then your identity in you. And I pray for those of us who maybe feel disconnected from the vine, even though we've been walking with you for years, I pray even now, Jesus, for your refreshing even as you say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I pray for rest for Harbor City today. I pray for refreshing. I pray for strengthening. I pray for encouragement. I pray, Lord God, that we would draw on the life that you are pulling up from yourself and that we would be strengthened and renewed and refreshed, that we would see you and know who you are, that we would know who we are and that you would fill us with your love now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.